welcome to the National Arts Club Knack at Home program. My name is Angela Louie. I am co-chair of the Fashion Committee and on the Board of Governors at the National Arts Club. It's very nice to see all of you here. For those who are unfamiliar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Today, we talk about all things scent related. It is such a big part of our lives. It is so interwoven with our other senses and yet it's not very well understood. This is why I'm so honored to introduce our lovely, extraordinarily knowledgeable and distinct guest today, Sue Phillips. Sue Phillips is a globally recognized fragrance expert having created fragrance brands for iconic companies such as Tiffany, Burberry, Lancasters, and others, as well as many top celebrities such as Jamie Foxx, Katie Holmes, and Zendaya. She is an adjunct professor at fragrance development and has taught at LIM College and FIT. With a mission to lift fragrance out of the bottle and to create magical scent experiences, Sue created Centerprises to share her passion and knowledge of scents and perfumes. Her book, The Power of Perfume, How to Choose It, Wear It, and Enjoy It is available for pre-order tonight through the link in the chat box and will be available to be shipped in a couple of weeks. Welcome, Sue. Sue, can you, perfect. Sue, I think you're muted right now. <laughs> Sue, I think you're muted right now. There we go, hello. Hi, how what? are you? <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. It's so nice to see you. It's so lovely to see you. And I will tell you that I'm so sad that we're not at the beautiful National Arts Club but it's just wonderful to see you here. And thank you for this wonderful opportunity, Angela. Well, I think this welcome. is about a, a year in the making, right? Yeah, at least a year in the making. I know that we, we have plans to do this program in person with everyone, but right. this, is, uh, this, is, this is good to do it this way. And we can certainly see each other in the club soon again. Um, I guess what, how, you know, I wanted to first um, talk about your passion for fragrance. Um, I guess the first question we have is how you came to be a fragrance expert. <laughs> well, actually, uh, quite by chance, because I had grown up with in South Africa, my mother was an amazing artist and calligraphist and musician. And so I always had the arts around me and surrounded, with, you know, I was surrounded by it. And uh, when I came to America, I wanted to be a singer and an actress because that's what I had always studied to be. But because I didn't have my green card at the time or my membership to the unions, I landed up working for immigration attorney and eventually got my green card. And so a headhunter, when I spoke to them, they said, well, you know, you're great in front of people, you'd be wonderful in training. And I said, well, what's training? And they said, you train the people behind the counter, the beauty advisors about fragrance. So I landed up becoming going to uh, the fragrance houses, getting an orientation, learning about fragrance. And I'll never forget, um, there was a gentleman called Jim Morton, and this is really a, a great testimony to him. He was the licensee uh, guru for Chloe Lagerfeld and a wonderful big guy. And I spent a day with him learning about fragrance. And he said to me, Sue, I want you to become a fragrance expert. I said, Jim, how do I do that? He said you'll become a fragrance expert. And I never forget those words ringing in my head. So 
I never trained to be a fragrance expert, although in a way, over the last 40 years, I have trained. So um, I have always loved fragrance. I love the arts. I love how fragrance makes you feel. It makes you feel uplifted. It can change your mood and change your, your emotions. It can recall memories and emotions. And, you know, when you're feeling down, just put on a wonderful fragrance and spray it and it could immediately transport you to somewhere else or uplift you. So I have become absolutely passionate. In fact, I cannot leave home without my fragrance. <laughs> what a great story. In fact, I, I think of this, uh, the, the saying where, uh, the saying of um, how you didn't choose the fragrance life, the fragrance life chose you. Yes. Um, now let's talk about this lovely book. How did you arrive at the idea of writing this exquisite book and um, what do you hope to accomplish with it? Well, I love to write. And over the years, I have written so many articles for so many different magazines. I was the uh, sort of a guest editor for Glow Magazine as the beauty editor. Um, I had written tons of articles and so on. And, you know, I just thought, what, you know, what's next? Um, I think one always thinks about being a an, an expert if you have something to really talk about, a book, a series or whatever. And I just thought, finally, it's time. And I started to write it just before the, the, um, the pandemic. Um, actually, yes, it was going to be ready, I think, in May. And then the pandemic hit and everything sort of was delayed so I just it's an homage in a way to the fragrance industry that has been so good to me and I have loved every minute of it and it's a way of really taking um, a trip down memory lane and you know helping people understand what fragrance means because over the last many many years of creating custom fragrances I've had so many questions from clients and fragrance lovers about perfume and scent and aroma that I just decided to put something together and really I had different titles but finally the power of perfume beckoned me and that's what it's called how to choose it wear it and enjoy it you know in a way publishing it and releasing it now is um, very special because we are in such unique times where one of the most talked about symptoms of COVID-19 is a loss of the sense of smell. So Sue, do you feel like um, there is this new awareness of the importance of scent and a new appreciation on the way it impacts our other senses? Absolutely. In fact, that's one of my, my presentation slides. Um, you know, Angela, how many people have never thought about the importance of their sense of smell? You know, people go along their daily lives and they go out for dinners and restaurants and so on. And they, they talk about the food and the ambiance and oh, something tastes delicious, but they never think about how food and flavor are so connected. And it is absolutely awful when you lose your sense of smell because your socialization stops. You know, people always say, let's meet for lunch or for breakfast, or for dinner, and some wonderful occasion where there's a lot of food and a lot of you know, convivial at atmosphere. And when people have lost their sense of smell and taste, they kind of retreat. They don't want to partake of socialization because they can't enjoy it. They can't sort of really add anything to the conversation. And so slowly and surely they start to retract from socialization and it's devastating. And in fact, there have been studies where people who've lost their sense and smell pre-COVID, and this has been going on for years, um, way before we are you know, affected by COVID, where through viral problems, certain car accidents, where people have lost their sense of smell and they have literally become so depressed, they opt out and they've passed away. So um, think about how important it is to have our sense of smell. And I always say we need to honor it. Well, thank you so much, Sue, for putting uh, through your book and through this presentation, a spotlight on this topic. We are all ready and excited to learn about the history, the art and the science of scent. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to ask you to take us through it and ask the audience to bear with us a few seconds while we um, get to that uh, screen share. 
Okay. Um, all I want to say is that this is not a, 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 a sort of a, a five hour historical retrospective, but it is a little trip down fragrance memory lane. And what I'll ask the audience to do is um, I'll ask you some questions. I'll ask you to put in the chat what your thoughts and your memories are about certain fragrances I bring up. So thank you, Angela. And I'm going to share my screen and talk to you tonight about the art of scent. So here we are. And let me just get to my... Um, have to just oh, okay there we go so as we talked about you know sense of smell is our most powerful sense and as i talked about covid you know we know about people who have lost their sense of smell and taste and the one thing that people might not know is scent triggers memory and emotions and our sense of smell is so connected why because our limbic system, that's the ancient and very primitive part of the brain is said to be the seat of emotion. So when you walk down the street and you smell something, it sort of sends a, a transmission to the impulses of the brain and you can literally stop dead in your tracks because you smelled something that might have, uh, you might recall a memory, a, lot, a, a, a love, a newborn baby, some kind of an aroma or fragrance that literally triggers that emotion. So it's very, very powerful. And uh, this has happened to me frequently. I can walk down the street and at certain times of the year, spring and fall, uh, the wind will change and I suddenly smell something in the air that reminds me of my childhood in South Africa. And I literally just have this amazing recall. So it's really, really powerful. So a lot of people don't really realize how important our sense of smell is. This is a, a chart by um, Martin Lindstrom, who's written Brand Sense. And you can see that our sense of sight, our sense of sight is our strongest, but our sense of smell is our most powerful. So the first is the strongest is sight, and then you have smell, and then going down the, the, the rest of the um, chart is sound, taste and touch and don't forget how taste and touch taste and smell are so related so i want to tell you a little bit about some of the main olfactory families and you might realize why certain fragrances appeal to you and why certain don't based on the fragrance family so the first is the citrus all those lovely light bright citrusy notes lemons limes bergamot grapefruit all those marvelous citrus notes and ingredients then we have the flowers, of course, everybody knows about flowers, rose, jasmine, lily of the valley, gardenia. Fruity is a wonderful category and a lot of young people like the fruity category because it's very young, it's very strawberry, the melons, the watermelons, the berries, they're just delicious and they're sort of that whole very fresh and young category, which became very popular a few years ago um, when the Bath and Body Works uh, companies started to put all those lovely sort of fruity notes out. The Oriental is a fragrance family that is really, if you go to your spice cabinet, you'll see all the spices right there, cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, um, even black pepper, all those lovely spicy exotic notes. And vanilla is actually considered a spice and is part of the Oriental family. And that's why we have these lovely um, vanilla beans and the orchid flower. The next category, which you might not know or be familiar with, is a category called Chypre. And take a look at the way it's spelt. It's spelt C-H-Y-P-R-E-S, which is based on the island of Cyprus. And I actually went to Cyprus because years ago, many perfumers traveled around the world looking for interesting ingredients. And when they got to the Mediterranean, the island of Cyprus, they said, ah, nous sommes en Chypre. And what they were smelling were these wonderful, earthy, mossy, patchouli, leathery notes. So they gave the name of that category after the island of Cyprus called Chypre. So when I went there with my daughter, I was so excited, but it's so built up. It's like a mini New York and they sell little tiny bottles of the Chypre fragrance. <laughs> so the next category is the woodsy, which is all the sandalwood, birchwood, cedarwood. And then you have the fougere, 
which are the lavender notes and the rosemary and all the herbaceous notes, lavender, rosemary, thyme, the ingredients that make you feel calming and relaxed. And then finally, the animalic. And although we don't do anything with perfumes uh, from animals anymore, that was a huge category. Remember musk? Remember ambergris? So if you want to, in the chat, put down, and I'd love to hear from you and make this interactive, what are the categories that you feel you love? And I know that this is a little complicated, so I've made it a little easier for you by narrowing it down to four main olfactory groups, the fresh, the floral, the woodsy, and the spicy. So when I talk to clients and I ask them, you know, what fragrances do they like and what kind of category, so many Americans say to me, oh, fresh and clean, fresh and clean. And I always like to say, well, what does fresh and clean mean to you? Fresh could be the smell of the ocean, could be the smell of a beautiful crisp mountain air. It could be the smell of lemons or limes, those wonderful, bright, refreshing notes. So fresh there, or the smell of rain, wonderful, fresh smell of rain. So there are a lot of uh, um, ingredients and categories in here that um, are a little bit more uh, complicated than just the fresh, the floral, the woodsy, the spicy, but it would be fun to hear about from you what of these, which olfactory groups and families um, mean to you. So I'd like to make this interactive. So hearing from you is wonderful. And then we'll, excuse me, we'll take a look at the, um, we'll look at your comments. So I'm going to take you on a trip down memory lane, fragrance through the decades. And I'm going to start at 1910. And I'm going to take you on a brief fragrance journey and show you why certain fragrances were iconic and still are, and why they typified the decade. So again, if you want to um, put in the chat what you think about some of these um, fragrances, and if they do recall memories for you, please let's hear from you. So in 1910, the uh, Francois Coty launched the fragrance Chypre. Again, an homage to the island of Cyprus, which I told you about is a combination of the woods, the moss, the citrus, leather, and patchouli. It's deep, it's smoldering, it's, it's very sensual. Uh, and it was a wonderful fragrance that really captivated Europe at the time. So the next one, and you can see, this was also the fashion of the day. Sort of, I like to talk about how fragrance um, and the financial, uh, political, economic, and uh, economic, uh, social, political, and economic trends were really typified by certain fragrances. So, of course, we all know about Chanel Number no. Five. Did you know that Chanel Number no. Five was launched in 1920? It has just celebrated its 100th anniversary. Think about how many fragrances are have that amazing sort of honor of being popular for 100 years. It's changed over the years, but this word aldehyde was one of the first modern day uh, ingredients used in perfumery with the flowers. It was actually a molecule made of ald aldehydes, which is from alcohol and dehydrogenated carbon oil. And when Chanel, Coco Chanel went to the perfumer and she wanted to make a fragrance, just the way you see all my fragrances in the back of me, um, she sat down with the perfumer Ernest Bow, and basically he created a fragrance for her because she said she wanted something fresh and very powdery and feminine and clean. And uh, he came up with eight different, different fragrances. And the fifth one she happened to love, and the fifth one had this aldehyde compound. It was a formula that he created made of the molecules as well as florals. And it was the fifth one. Her birthday is on the 5th of May. Her lucky number is number five. So she chose the number five. And when Ernest Beau went back to the uh, perfumer in the lab, he says, Jacques, what did you do? You put too much aldehyde in the formula. By the way, it's been the most popular and the most <laughs> successful fragrance of all time. So a little error sometimes goes a long way. <laughs> The 1920s continued with a beautiful classic European fragrance with vanillin. Vanillin is an organic compound made basically from the vanilla bean. 
And this was a beautiful fragrance called Shalimar, which was a love story about the emperor of India who fell in love with his bride in the beautiful garden of Shalimar. So I'd love to know how many of you have worn or still wear Coco Chanel number no. five and Shalimar. And if you do, what they mean to you. This might be a fragrance that you're not too familiar with. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, this is a beautiful fragrance from Guerlain called Vol de Nuit, Night Flight. And this was a tribute to Amelia Earhart, who was the first woman aviator. So this was a one, and you can see the wheels of the uh, aircraft in the, captured in the bottle of the, um, of the bottle of the packaging. So um, this was a lovely fragrance, not terribly familiar. You're not very familiar with a lot of it, but uh, still popular. And of course, we all know about Miss Dior, the cinched in wastes, the new deal. And again, this was a modern cheaper. It has changed over the years, this Dior. There are several Dior incarnations uh, of fragrance, but this was the classic from the 1940s. And you can also see some of the categories. Who remembers Youth Do by Estee Lauder? This was actually a perfume bath oil, not a perfume, but it was so strong and so concentrated that women put it on their wrists and it lasted all day, sometimes two days. So this was an amazing fragrance, which really I think started the uh, Estee Lauder company on its way by Estee Lauder herself. It was very distinctive bath oil. And you can see how it sort of emulated the fashion of the day, the new look with the cinched in waist. So you can see the packaging with the cinched in sort of middle of the bottle. And can you believe that Dis Disneyland started in the 50s? Uh, the 60s, what would we be without the 60s and Twiggy and the hippies and, and Musk? And the first American designer was Norell. How many of you have ever worn Norell by Norell? So this was a very, very important fragrance from the American designer standpoint. And it was the first moon landing in 1969. So a lot happened in the 60s. The hippies, the Beatles, Twiggy, the uh, moon landing, and the start of the fragrance category in the 1960s with the American designer. Okay, women striding with confidence down the roads. Charlie, the first lifestyle scent, really defined the decade with emancipated women really finding their, their independence. Bell bottoms were around. Diane von Furstenberg's wrap dress, platform heels. And think about this. That was the time that Microsoft was launched. Where would we be today um, without the, you know, Microsoft. And as you can see in the next slide, um, next two slides after that, but um, how Microsoft has really changed our, our lives. And we'll talk about the rest later on. 1980s, do you know what happened in 1980s? It really reflected the bold, flamboyant, decadent, wealthy uh, socialization, the dynasty TV show um, with the big hairdo, big shoulder pads, and uh, you know the fragrance, of course, Georgia Beverly Hills, a beautiful, bold, big pineapple fragrance, which was so recognizable. And do you know that the fragrance was banned from restaurants because it was so powerful and it really interfered with the food. So the restaurateurs decided to ban Georgia Beverly Hills and it was actually written on the menu. Please do not wear Georgia Beverly Hills. <laughs> that was probably another way it became so popular. So how many of you wore Georgia Beverly Hills? I'd love to hear from you. So let's put it in the chat. And then the 1980s, let's not forget about the whole androgyny as aspect with um, Obsession for Men by Calvin Klein. So suddenly sexuality and sensuality became sort of de rigueur. Calvin Klein really stretched the boundaries with his um, obsession fragrance. In fact, I think the TV ad was banned, but it started and look at the uh, look at the advertising with all these beautiful naked bodies, not a not an extra pound on any of them. <laughs> so very, very, very um, sensual fragrance obsession was oriental, spicy, warm, no longer the beautiful big pineapple fruity notes of the Georgia, but now coming to a little bit more 
sensual and uh, sexy. The 90s totally sort of ran away from that. It became very minimalistic. Uh, the fragrance became very transparent, very aquatic. Those ozonic, lovely marine notes, those watery notes, those transparent notes. And in fact, people reflected, uh, really denounced um, the whole idea of consumerism. They didn't want to wear their fancy designer logos, anything. Everything became very, very much more minimalistic. And this was the beginning of the World Wide Web as we know it today. Do you all remember Low DC, the water of Issy? So this was a very interesting fragrance, Angel. It was a, a beautiful fragrance, a total departure from the florals or the, girl, or the woodsy or the spicy. It was a gourmand edible note. It was the first gourmand edible note made from chocolate and caramel and candy floss. And Terry Mugler, when asked about his fragrance, recalled a memory of going to the fairgrounds with his, I think his mother or his grandmother, and she would give him candy floss and caramel candy and chocolates and all those beautiful edible notes stayed with him all his life. And he wanted to create a fragrance as a tribute to his grandmother. And he loved her nail polish remover. So in this beautiful edible gourmand note, there's also a slight little bit of a sort of, um, as, uh, as, as not as spicy so much, but a little bit of an, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, what are, the acetone, the nail polish remover, because that's what he associated with her. So again, you can see how fragrance is really triggering memories and emotions. And this fragrance really reflected Terry Mugler's childhood memories. The bottle was so beautiful. It was really thought of as a sculpture and too beautiful to throw away. So the company came up with a very innovative idea at the counter. So women would bring their fragrance bottles and they didn't want to lose them. So they would actually dram the fragrance that would be to decant the fragrance into these beautiful bottles. So it would be a collectible. And uh, Terry Boonglay, as we know, has broken barriers in fashion and of course now in fragrance. And then we started with the 1980s to 2000, the whole idea of celebrity fragrances. Liz Taylor was the first with passion, followed by diamonds, white diamonds. And jo J Lo um, has still launching, and I'll show you her in a little bit. But the whole idea of celebrity fragrances launch, and every single celebrity has come up with fragrances, um, men and women, over the last um, 20 years or so. At the time of the millennial, there was a whole resurgence of back to vintage classic fragrances, the whole idea of nostalgia and you know, a remembrance of things past came to be. And of course, what were the most classic fragrances of yesteryear? They were the classics, the Chanel's and the Shalimar's and even the fragrance called Arpege, I don't know if you remember that. So that was sort of the, the 2000s. And now suddenly, um, after a, so many thousands of fragrances being launched over the years with celebrity fragrances and designer fragrances, suddenly the word bespoke came to be. And a lot of Americans didn't know what bespoke meant. It was actually um, a term used by the British for clothing, mostly for men, as in, I want to make, I want to wear a particular suit made for me. And the term bespoke reflected and re re uh, related to clothing. Um, and ultimately bespoke became known as customization. And so customization has been so very, very popular in the last 10 years or so, or 15 years. So I always say, why wear what everybody else when you can create your own? And so a whole new category emerged, um, the idea of personalization. And I started my custom fragrance business 12 years ago, and there have been a lot of companies who have now followed suit, uh, who are all doing customization. And today with the internet and with um, social media and YouTube, everybody is a brand. So there are thousands and thousands of fragrances being launched all the time. 
And if you wanted to know the volume of the perf global market, perfume market, it is really growing, believe it or not. In 2020, it was just about 34 billion, up almost seven or 8% over 2019. Sales are projected for 2020 to 2025 at about 44 billion. And looks like, oh, this is a typo. This should be 54 million. Oh, excuse me. Which leads us to why I'm here today, talking about my book. And I'm so excited to tell you about the power of perfume, how to wear it, choose it, and enjoy it. And I'm excited to show it to you and share it to you. And there's some wonderful tributes and testimonials, but um, I hope you enjoyed our fragrance journey and I hope you learned a little bit. And I would love to know what your thoughts are about some of the fragrances I highlighted. So, Angela. Fantastic. Um, terrific, thank you. And that's, the, that's all of the information. Um, for Sue, you can also purchase uh, the book in the chat link below. And now I'm going to stop my screen sharing and join you again in virtual reality. So I hope you enjoyed <laughs> this, everybody. Well, I haven't seen I haven't seen the comments, but I'm sure I will later on. I just want you to know, all know that I'm so grateful to all of the the participants here tonight. I understand that there are about 705 people that there were about an hour ago when I spoke to Angela. So for all you fragrance lovers, thank you for coming on. And you're amidst a wonderful array of fragrance lovers. So I'm delighted to talk to, even though I can't see you all, I'm so excited that you're all here. So thank you and, and let us hear from you. <laughs> well, I first I wanna say thank you for a fantastic presentation. It was filled with so much information about uh, we, we, we went through the history a little bit, the science um, of, uh, of scent, and clearly um, from the activity in the chat box, this is a very, very popular topic. Um, just a reminder, Sue's book, uh, The Power of Perfume, How to Choose It, Wear It, and Enjoy It, is available for pre-order through the link in the chat box and it will be available to be shipped in a couple of weeks. I also noticed in the chat box that um, Jeffrey Banks wanted to offer an interesting fact, Norel created by Revlon for Norman Norel was created by female nose, which, is, which was very unusual for its time. Um, so thanks, thank you, Jeffrey. So thank I you, Jeffrey, for saying that. And actually my friend Don Loftus who I have known for many years, was the president of a company called Parallax, who introduced, um, who introduced the fragrance Norel. Wonderful. Um, great. So I wanted to start with this first question, which is, yes. so can you tell us the right way to wear <laughs> perfume? Do you, I've noticed people spray it on their neck on their wrist, some spray it in the air and walk through it. What do you recommend? Well, I love the story and I'm, thank you for ask, asking, I don't know who asked the question, but I will tell you that. Um, so I used to go to Paris very often on business. And when I created the fragrance for Tiffany and then Burberry and Trish McAvoy, I met with all the perfumers in Paris. And one of the first encounters with a French perfumer was a wonderful perfumer. And she said to me, ah, and she thought I was American, so sorry, Americans. I'm going to take a little bit of a, a, a swipe at Americans right now and a swipe at French with my French accent. So she said, oh, you Americans, you have no idea how to wear the perfume. She said, we in France, we have been wearing perfumes for centuries. We know that the fragrance rises as a body heat forms a perfume. And after all, you want to have the fragrance envelop you. So start to wear the fragrance from the bottom up at the ankles or the feet. So when you have the long skirt swishing, the fragrance will waft up through the air. So at the ankles, behind the knees, in between the thighs, in the bosom area, at all the pulse points and wherever you want to be kissed, she says. What does the Americans do? A spritz here and a spritz here. Who do they attract? The birds and the clouds. <laughs> so where should you wear fragrance? 
well, in winter, you don't want to waste your beautiful fragrance by wearing it on the ankles or the feet or so on. But fragrance is really meant to be worn on the warm pulse points. So at the wrists, in, in the crook of the arm, you know, when you go to the doctor, they take your pulse because that's where the pulse, the blood sort of comes to the surface. So at the wrists, at the pulse points, behind, the, at the nape of the neck. And some people wear, say to wear fragrance on clothes. I do not recommend wearing fragrance on clothes. I do not recommend wearing perfume behind your neck because women who have long hair, it's a little bit of a place where you might perspire. So you don't want to have the fragrance distorted on clean, unscented, moisturized skin out of your shower, moisturized with a little unscented moisturizer, and then spray your fragrance over you. And it'll adhere to you, it'll last longer, and it'll envelop you and make you feel amazing. But not on the clothes and not on the hair. Your hair, they say spray it in the air and walk through it. Well, why would you want to spray a fragrance in the air that's going to, it's a very expensive fragrance where it's just going to dissipate and get distorted from, um, through the shampoo and the conditioner. So that's my recommendation for wearing fragrance. <laughs> I think we're all going to remember those instructions with the, uh, uh, in our, in our memory with you in a French accent. So thank you. Um, so the, the, you know, I noticed in the comment section that oftentimes people really enjoyed a uh, scent that wasn't overpowering. So how much should we wear um, perfume and cologne? So do you, what I should do is tell you the difference between perfume and cologne, because mm -hmm. perfume and cologne and eau de parfum, and eau de, they're all different concentrations. So think about this. Perfume is the strongest, most concentrated perfume. And if you take a perfume bottle, the perfume bottle, uh, much like when, you know, we mix salad dressing, you have the oil and the vinegar and the water and so on, 25 to 30% of the fragrance oil is in a perfume concentration formula. And then it's mixed with certain water and alcohol and uh, sort of the, um, uh, uh, the proper alcohol, not just any kind of alcohol. But perfume has the most amount of formula ingredients in the perfume. And as it's diluted, it gets diluted with uh, alcohol and water, and water, and then it becomes eau de parfum. And the more it's diluted, the more, the less concentrated it is. So the concentrations are perfume, eau de parfum, eau de toilette, eau de cologne, and then eau de toilette. And uh, it's all a question of concentration. So the most concentrated is your perfume. The less concentrated are the eau de parfum, eau de toilette, and eau de cologne. And um, somebody asked, may, may you touch on the history of the name eau de toilette? I just saw that. Yes, I'll be happy to. Um, so eau de toilette literally means the water for the toilet. For when women in France made their sort of um, their bathing rituals and the French expression, ça faire, de la, ça faire la toilette is to make your toilette, to prepare you for your, um, for your cleansing, if you will. And so toilet, water is the literal translation of eau de toilette and um that's where the word comes from it's a french word and it was part of the bathing ritual and they used their toilet water for bathing and then the, some people scented it and that's basically how it became part of the fragrance category thank you that's very very fascinating um i notice in the comment section that Oftentimes people loved the, the scent of a perfume, but later on it gave them headaches later on in life, or they love something and someone wore it and it, it caused headaches. And for other scents, it doesn't cause any headaches. So I guess the question they're asking is, why would some other fragrance give them headaches and why would others not? Great question. Thank you, whoever asked that. So again, I have to tell you, it's all about quality. Now, we all know about, and I will correlate it to champagne or wine. If you drink really good quality champagne, the best quality, 
you can have five or six or seven glasses. You will never get a headache. You'll never get any sort of allergic reaction. You might get a little tipsy, <laughs> but you won't get sort of that. The same is true for wines with all the sulfates. And the same thing true is the same is true for fragrances. You know, when in, in my presentations and in my book, I talk about the how fragrances were created and why perfume was sort of started in grass and why the ingredients were so important. And it all had to do with the natural ingredients. And over the years, certain fragrance ingredients have now either been banned or they're no longer able to be made or they're discontinued. And so what happens is fragrance is an art and a science. The art is knowing how to combine them. The science is knowing what to combine them with. And so because certain ingredients are no longer being able to be sourced or harvested, um, perfumers are very resourceful and they try and recreate through headspace technology, some of the ingredients that are found in nature but are no longer being able to use. Some of those ingredients sadly do give headaches and allergies. And I will tell you honestly, I've been in the fragrance industry for 40 years you're supposed to say no way, Sue. <laughs> but no way, Sue. <laughs> but the truth is that I've never heard of more complaints of headaches and allergies than I have in the last 10 years. People who have come to me at my perfume studio, either at the Centarium or where I am now, said to me, and I used to love a fragrance, but it's changed. I get headaches and allergies. Well, sadly, it's some of the ingredients are not the purest of ingredients, or they may be made synthetically. And sometimes synthetics can be wonderful, but synthetics also can give a sort of deleterious reaction because of the chemicals. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we've got some people, um, you know, a few people who wanted to ask you um, about, you know, your, your uh, about Centerprises, about your um, company. So the first thing they wanted to understand is how you begin to design a fragrance for an individual. What do you do? How do you come, how do you arrive at what is um, good for, for this individual and how do you arrive at that conclusion together? Well, um, I've, you know, when I was in the corporate arena and I created fragrances for Tiffany and Burberry and Avon and all these big companies, we really looked at the brand ethos. What did the brand represent? Was it a, um, was it a luxury brand? Was it a, a, a casual brand? Was it for women, for men or both? And so you start to look at the architecture of the brand and start to create it that way. And that's really how most people and most companies work. They, they want to create a fragrance. They you know, find perfumers or companies who are doing it. And the perfumers then, um, uh, the companies are given a profile of, of everything I talked about, what the company is, the demographics, who it's for, what the target range, price range, and so on. So that is called a profile. So um, having known all this and learned all this, when I started my fragrance company, Centerprises, um, I had left Tiffany to have my daughter, and I was creating fragrances for Burberry and Trish McAvoy and Avon and so on. And then in 2008, the financial collapse happened. And I said, what do I do? I have to do something. And I started thinking about the customization. And so what I've done at my perfume, uh, with my bespoke perfume business, the profile that I give is a questionnaire to my clients because I get calls all the time. I want to make a fragrance. I want to launch it at Macy's. I want to do it this. And I want to, you know, but what is the, sort of defining characteristic of that person and how is it going to make that person feel. So I've developed a scent personality quiz, which is actually in the back of the book. Uh, you can take the scent personality quiz and then you can send in your results and I will evaluate it. And this is what I do. So knowing that, um, and I actually equate it to the four fragrance family, the fresh, the floral, the woodsy, the spicy, and the different questions once you tabulate it, determine whether the perfume, whether the uh, client prefers fresh or floral or citrus or woodsy. And it's really interesting. It is absolutely 100% accurate. I, I always have to say, well, I'll give one or two percentage points for you know, being an, a little bit off, but it works for men and for women. And invariably, we're able to understand what they like 
and then I take them on a fragrance journey. You can see all the bottles behind me. Those are my 18 blends. And I take them on a fragrance journey and they evaluate all the different blends, the citrus, the, the musk, the green, the ozonic, the uh, different flowers, rose flower, gardenia. And at the end, they've taken 18 different fragrances and they reject the ones that they don't like and they take the ones that they love and then they combine them. And ultimately people create their own custom fragrance. And I've had so many amazing reactions and talk about fragrance and memory and emotion. I'll give you one example. A young woman who's a beautiful woman, and I think she's in my book. Um, I see, and oh, at the end of the fragrance journey, people uh, find the name. They also, they also come up and create their own name that they want to offer. The and so I said, well, what are you gonna call your fragrance? She said, no, Libby. And she was so emotional. I said, why are you so emotional? She said, this fragrance is just so beautiful. She said, it's reminding me of the time that I spent in New Orleans with my grandfather and the beautiful flowers from New Orleans and um, Nola B. So she said, he was the man who actually trained Muhammad Ali and came up with the expression, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And she said, the fragrance was so beautiful and and powerful but soft it was a powerful fragrance but it also had the beautiful sort of lightness of the flying of the bee not stinging like the bee but flying so she called her fragrance nola bee and i thought that was such a great um tribute and she got very emotional another young woman uh sarah Priebus, who was the uh host on hq trivia and it's all on my youtube channel you can see some of these um youtube videos she got so emotional and she said, Sue, I don't know why I'm getting so emotional. She said, but I'm going to call my fragrance gratitude because I'm so grateful for all the things I've done. It's just bringing up all this feeling of gratitude. So people really can reflect their individuality and their personality through fragrance and wearing their own fragrance and making it very, very meaningful for them. Thank you for sharing that. That's such a lovely story. You know, we we had a question come in while you were talking about um, uh, people, I, you know, uh, identifying a specific scent that's right for them. Do you think that there is a scent that um, is more appropriate for the day and one that's one that's appropriate to wear during the evening? Well, I do think so, um, because, you know, I'm also looking at the, co the, the comments. Some people say certain fragrances were too heavy and too. So typically, you know, <clears throat> something for the daytime is usually you like to be sort of something fresh and sort of exhilarating, making you feel exuberant and refreshing and getting back to the fresh and clean uh, comments that most people like, men and women. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, we associate evening fragrances with being sophisticated and sensual and exotic and passionate. And some of the deeper, darker, more sensual ingredients like the ambers, the spicy notes, the, the deeper flowers like gardenia and the sensual woodsy notes are more appropriate for the evening. So, you know, certain companies actually before COVID had banned people from wearing heavy perfumes because they didn't feel it reflected the right uh, image for the company. So that is why some people actually wear lower co uh, concentration. They might use an eau de toilette or they might use an eau de cologne or a body lotion or a bath gel for a fragrance that's not as heavy, but they still want to have their fragrance, their signature scent. So, you know, what I would say is choose the fragrance you love to wear. But if it's going to give people sort of negative comments, oh, it's too strong, then either lighten it by maybe diluting it a little bit with um, um, maybe some, you know, perfumers alcohol, or getting a lighter version in a body lotion or a, a cream or that kind of thing. But um, yes, I do think just the way we wear different clothing for day and for night, you know, you wouldn't wear a little black evening dress with sequins during the day. So, and you wouldn't wear casual, you know, tennis shorts at night if you're going on a date. So I think being appropriate is important. That makes perfect sense. Um, 
we wanted to ask you about your thoughts on quality assurance. There was an audience member who uh, tested certain brands in St. Bart's and noticed that they smelled better to, to this person than when she tested the same brands in the U.S. Have you noticed that too? So there's something about... Um... <laughs> I'm looking at some of these comments. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to read your comments. I'm loving them. So, you know, certain fragrances, I would say that that equates to certain fragrances in Europe where you can have the same brand, but because it's made in Europe, it has the European water, the European alcohol. And so it's different than American water and American alcohol. And yes, there can definitely be a difference. You know, some people feel that made in France is much more important than anything made in America or China or, or you know, other areas. So um, I think you just have to really develop your sense of smell. And I think you have to um, uh, develop your sense of smell and know what the, what the elements are that you happen to love mm. and then try and find them because uh, if you feel that a French fragrance and you find it the duty-free airports um, is literally from France uh, and you prefer the French version than an American version, um, hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll find it again and again, but there are differences, I have to say. I, I do think though that through regulation and through the different organizations and the different regulatory bodies, perfumers really do want to make a consistent fragrance because we're living in a global world, you know, we're international, we travel where we used to, but we will travel again, that people will really want to find their same brand worldwide. Um, sadly, there are some ingredients that are banned by the EU that, you know, have been named as allergens and they're no longer being able to be produced. And that's why certain ingredients um, fall the way of, you know, being discontinued. Mm. So as a nose in the industry, can you recommend to someone a way to improve their own sense of smell? I love this because I... I, I say to people, you know, this sounds silly, but when you go to the supermarket and you look at all those gorgeous citrus, you know, products, your lemon, the lime, the orange, the grapefruit, the tangerine, here's a great way to really try and build your sense of smell and your awareness. So when you look at a grapefruit and you smell it, you know what it smells like. And you look at an orange or a lemon or a lime. But now if you buy all those products and you put them on a table and you blindfold yourself and you pick up one of them, it's going to be very hard for you to distinguish whether it's a lemon or a lime or, an, or a bergamot or a tangerine or a grapefruit because we're not using our sense of smell. And our sense of smell is our most powerful sense. So I say to people, please just pick up those products, you know, even, even think about peach, apricot, nectarine, how similar they are, but they all have a distinctive smell. So the next time you go to a supermarket, pick them up and see if you can identify them. And that's the way you can really enhance and sort of really heighten your sense of smell. What is, um, what would you say is um, a key difference in someone wearing essential oils for fragrance versus perfume? So essential oils um, have the consistency of olive oil. So, you know, olive oil is very heavy, it's occlusive. So if you put olive oil on your skin, it's gonna sort of leave a residue and it's gonna be there. It's not going to absorb into your skin and it'll just be there, it's very heavy. The difference between um, sort of uh, um, essential oils and fragrance, that even if it's a perfume, perfume, does have alcohol in it. And the alcohol will lift the fragrance and it'll absorb into your skin. So if you have your, your uh, olive oil and you put it on your skin, it'll stay there. But if you can actually spray your fragrance and you'll see it'll, I don't know if you can see it through here, but it'll last for a little bit. It's not heavy, but you'll see very soon it's going to, it's going to dry. Whoop, there you go, it's going to dry. And what will be left, the alcohol will lift off and the beautiful 
fragrance ingredients will stay. So look, it's the, the liquid is gone, but I smell the beautiful fragrance and it's not heavy and occlusive. So that's the difference. Ah, thank you for that. We've all always wondered, um, you know, we, I, I've, uh, you'll see in the comments a lot of people talking about some of their favorite perfumes. I, I see that I'm, I'm trying to find them yeah and and in some of those comments they they're sad in that they've been discontinued and so the question that we have for you Sue is do you have any insights on why a company might decide to change or stop making a certain perfume is it because of a response to decline sales, change of taste. Uh, why might that be? Well, uh, several reasons. Um, sort of from a commercial standpoint, maybe the fragrance doesn't sell anymore. So, you know, they discontinue it and they come up with a new one. And that's really <laughs> where I came up with, somebody came up with the, the expression, you know, flavor of the month, because every five minutes they were launching a new fragrance. Um, even these seasonal fragrances, you know, fragrance for spring, for summer, for winter. Um, certainly, you know, nobody wants to be in business to lose money. And the cost of launching a fragrance and developing it and marketing it is really very, very um, high. It, it, it's cost very a lot of money. Um, but then what happens is, you know, tastes change. You can see in the presentation, every decade had a sort of iconic feel. And the 80s fragrances, which were very bold and exuberant, wouldn't have worked in the 1990s because that was really a, a much more sort of transparent. So it's also a question of the times, the political, the social, the economic trends. Um, if fragrances are you know, going to be popular and are going to be you know, generating revenue for the companies, if um, not every company is going to have a Chanel number five, even though it's changed over the years and somebody said Chanel number five was very heavy. I think that's why they came up with a lighter version to appeal to the existing Chanel customer, but also to answer the sort of questions of what's happening from a social, political and economic standpoint, trends change. So that's the reason. And then of course, the other reason is certain ingredients are no longer being able to be used, you know, animal ingredients. So musk comes from the deer or the civet cat. So how did perfumers find that? I always tell my clients, um, you know, perfumers travel the oceans, the, the cities, the forests, they're always looking for interesting ingredients. And musk comes from the deer, uh, also the civet, yes, from the deer and the civet cat, but you know, they get a little sexually aroused. They sort of make certain secretions. So how or why those perfumers found those secretions, we're not going to go there. <laughs> but certain ingredients are no longer being able to be used. So again, a musk was so in the, in the 60s. I mean, that's all you smelled was musk. And now today you don't smell it as much for several reasons. You know, it's not as heavy. It's not as popular. Uh, you can't get real musk anymore because it's been banned. Um, so that's that's sort of one of the reasons. You know, we are at the end of the hour, but there are so many questions. So I'm going to keep going. And okay. uh, those who, you know, need to sign off, this will be available to be replayed so you can catch, you know, the last few questions. But I wanted to follow up on that specific topic because so many people have these um, favorites but it's not being um, you know, sold anymore. And they wanted to ask you, Sue, if there is a better way of storing these perfume um, that no longer they can no longer buy. And is there a time limit to yes. use this, these, these perfume bottles? By the way, great questions. And I'm, as I'm listening to Angela ask, you know, I'm sort of flipping through the, the, the comments and the questions and they're beautiful questions. And thank you all for really, taking up my sort of quest for you to ask, ask questions in the chat and tell me what you think about these fragrances. So I'm gonna try and get to them also through and with Angela's help. So how to store fragrance? Well, fragrance I would say is like great white or great wine. You know, um, beautiful wines <clears throat> are stored in vats and they're stored with in temperatures, temperature controlled fridges or rooms because the ingredients are so special and are so um, sensitive to light, 
to cold, to temperatures. And so fragrances too. And I would never recommend storing fragrance in a bathroom that gets overheated with the steam because, you know, first of all, it's going to distort the fragrance. And if the fragrance isn't well secured, if you use the fragrance every day, so the cap is lifts off and it gets oxidized, it's going to distort the fragrance. Um, the other thing is I don't ever believe in putting fragrance in a fridge because fragrances are not meant to be cold. They're meant to be room temperature. So I would say store fragrance even on your dressing room, away from direct sunlight, away from your temperature, your air conditioning, or your heating, put it in a, on a lovely tray on a dressing table, away from the direct light, away from cold, away from heat, and it'll last. And I have actually got fragrances, believe it or not, when I was at Elizabeth Arden, um, one of the first products that my boss, Joe Ronchetti, gave me as a welcome to be the training director was the beautiful two ounce bottle of Chloe perfume, the original Chloe perfume with the calla lilies. Um, I've had it for, I won't tell you how long, but almost 40 years. Uh, I don't really use it because it's such a beautiful collectible, but every now and again, I'll take untwist it and I'll smell it and it's just beautiful so it's lasted that long but I haven't worn it and I haven't really had it exposed to direct sunlight so I would say store your fragrances in a way that is going to help protect them that you can still enjoy them but don't expose them to direct light and temperatures I would say that Fragrances, if you do it that way, can last you up to, say, four or five years. If you see the color changing, it gets a little oxidized. Maybe the fragrance was a lovely golden hue to start with, and now it's sort of turning into almost like a rum color, you know, that it's being distorted. Mm. You, Sue, so you've um, smelled so many different fragrances from all over the world, and as a fragrant expert, we've got, this is probably the most asked question for you. They want to know your own personal three top fragrances, three top scents that you've either created or that you have come across. Oh my God, you're asking me to name my children. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, okay, so this is probably a little bit showing you my age because there are some magnificent, magnificent fragrances that um, I will tell you about ones that I haven't created that I just feel are so reflect quality and a feeling of luxury and a feeling of positivity and confidence. So one that I love is Mitsuko, um, which is beautiful. I think it's been changed again, it's by Galen and it's a beautiful fragrance, which I think is magnificent. Uh, and that is like a spicy floral. The next fragrance that I really loved is it was a Chypre, getting back to Chypre, was Cabochard by Madame Gray. How many of you remember, and it's okay, you can put it in the chat, it's, it's a very sort of wonderful fragrance, Cabochard by Madame Gray. And it's a deep, sensual, patchouli, Chypre fragrance with oak moss. I mean, it's just and gorgeous. Um, but also very, very, um, I think for a sophisticated time of day, it's a sophisticated night. It's certainly a fragrance that you wanna wear with a, with a loved one and so on. It's not one of those fresh, fresh fruity ones. Um, now, suddenly Josephine just talked about the scent of freshly mown green grass, Vent Vare comes closest to me, Spa Balmain. So I love that whole category, believe it or not, Cabochard then came up with a fragrance called Cabotine, which is a beautiful, fresh sort of green fragrance, a green floral. Um, beautiful. And I agree with you, Josephine. Yes, the scent of freshly mown green grass. I have a beautiful blend called Green, my sort of um, sparkling green. It is the scent of freshly mown cut green grass, a scent of, um, and a scent of green leaves with a little bit of hyacinth. So it gives it a little bit of that freshness and that sweetness. So, and then the other one that I love, let's see. Um, uh, Mitsuko, Kabushad, Kabutin, and some modern ones. Um, 
I like my fragrances a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do. I, I'm, I'm so excited also to talk a little bit about uh, your fragrances. Let me let me ask uh, one thing because someone someone is asking this, and I I want to show you. So when people put perfume, they spritz it on their wrist. Sometimes they rub it. Sometimes they smash it. Is that a no no or is that okay? Yes, it's a no no. <laughs> Okay. And I'll tell you what, and I'll get to the Jiki question from Terry. Um, Jiki also, I think Jiki also comes in one of those magnificent plastic fragrances, which are just, you know, ugh. the Galan fragrances were beautiful. Some of the newer ones, again, are a little bit more synthetics, but, you know, they try and maintain the quality. But I would say Mitsuko and Jiki are beautiful. So getting back to Angela's question, so why do people spray on the wrist and then rub it like crazy, like you're trying to out, out, out damn spot? Why do you do that? There's no reason to. Because if a fragrance is made with beautiful natural ingredients, you don't want to distort that with, you know, the oils from your skin. So you just have to spray the fragrance and actually just, if you want to, just let it air dry, just, you know, wave your arm around and please don't do that because it's really going to crush the beautiful molecules of the fragrance you don't have to do that so spray one there and one there and then you'll be okay some people also do it and put it on their neck like that um you know you can be lavish with your fragrance um because you can always get another bottle <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the scents that you create. Um, we have a question um, that is asking how you mix scents for your clients. So thank you for that question. By the way, these questions are amazing. I think we have 81 new messages. So thank you all for writing. And I'm looking at the categories, the floral and spicy, fresh and woodsy. Yes, um, and floral and fresh spicy fresh herbs and some spicy lavender lemongrass vanilla beautiful um sorry i'm just so captivated by these questions uh, uh angela so um i actually when i left tiffany and i left my the corporate world to have my daughter and then 2008 happened um the economy crashed and you know the consulting had dried up and i decided to take my knowledge and start to think about creating a bespoke customization initiative. And um, because by this stage, I had learned about the different notes and the different um, sort of categories, the fresh, the floral, the woodsy, the spicy, and all the ingredients, I wanted to come up with a wonderful way that was affordable and easy, but still quality and luxurious. Now, why do I say that? Because the idea of bespoke perfumes was originally only really the area of nobility, royalty, or the very, very wealthy celebrities who wanted something for themselves. And, you know, the idea of starting a fragrance from fresh, literally cultivating the ingredients, finding them, harvesting them, you know, um, formulating them, and then testing them and testing them again and again, could take a year or two or three or four, and can literally cost thousands and thousands. Um, that's why it was for the nobility or the very wealthy or royalty or whatever. And I wanted to come up with a way that was still affordable, but still luxurious. And so I created my 18 perfume blends, which span the entire olfactive palette, the citrus, the green, the ozonic, the aldehydic, which is the Chanel number no. five, the herbaceous notes, the different florals, the fresh floral, the rose beautiful i've got a beautiful exotic rose flower which i'll talk about in a minute so the different flowers and 18 different blends and it took about two or three years for me to create them and once i have them they're really beautiful they're great quality and the beauty about what we do is you can choose each of the 18 and then what we say is you know narrow you can take one or combine two or combine three or up to four the more you combine the less distinctive it comes and the more sort of soupy it becomes. So you want your fragrance to be distinctive. So the idea is you take the fragrance journey, you evaluate the fragrances, you select three or four that you love, and that becomes your fragrance. And the beauty about my fragrances is that each one is a beautiful, distinctive fragrance, and it can be combined. So there's no bad combination. So that's how we sort of come to work with 
with our clients and create a fragrance for them. And it's great for men and for women. Well, so what is also very notable is, is your career. And I think, you know, um, it's, it's been inspiring for a lot of the audience members. There's a question that's asking for your advice uh, <laughs> on, you know, on what should someone um, do to begin uh, their career in fragrance? Well, um, that's a lovely question. So I don't know where this person is, and but there are certain um, colleges uh, like FIT um, that offers a fragrance class. I was actually the adjunct professor there. Also at LIM College, uh, I taught there. I think the new school offers one too. If you are a, at a point where you don't want to go back to school and you just want to learn, there are so many tutorials online. Um, there are so many... <sighs> As I said earlier, there are so many thousands of fragrances being launched because everybody today is a brand. Everybody's on YouTube, social media. So, you know, you can do it. And then I think once you have sort of studied that and you're interested in it, um, I'd be happy to talk to you if you wanted to come and make an appointment. I'm always happy to make people, you know, make appointments. Um, I moved into a beautiful pop-up boutique. Um, I had my fragrance studio downtown in Tribeca for eight years. I called it the Centarium, and um, it was so great because it was like a little oasis in the heart of, you know, New York down in Tribeca, and you came down these sort of dinky, winky little steps, and suddenly it became this beautiful oasis of perfume and music and all my mother's artwork, and it was just a beautiful um, um, sort of space. And then I had to leave at the end of July last year because the pandemic happened and then the owners were selling the building. And so I'm in a wonderful situation now. I don't know how many of you have heard of Noest, Vanessa Noel. Uh, she's a fantastic shoe designer and I've known her and she has this beautiful shoe boutique on, on 64th and 3rd, between 3rd and next. And um, this is where I'm, I am. I have my beautiful perfume boutique here and I'm so happy and grateful to, to Vanessa. And we just actually have collaborated on the first Noel Shoe Museum perfume for her uh, shoe museum, which she's launching and opening the first shoe museum in America. And so this is the Noel Shoe Museum packaging. Oh, it's hard to see, I guess, with the screen screen. But, um, you know, uh, we actually do see clients by appointment and uh, socially distancing, even though we do smell the fragrances, evaluate them, we sit six, in, six feet apart or more, and people can take off their mask as they're evaluating fragrances. But, um, you know, I think there are so many companies offering fragrances. Sometimes I've heard of people going to fragrance, buying certain fragrances that sadly um, haven't really helped them and they either haven't shown up or they aren't, they aren't quality fragrances. So if you want any help or advice, please feel free to contact me. You know, um, we saw in your presentation, there were these categories um, that were very popular for certain decades. Yes. So our final question for you uh, is, what do you predict will be the fragrance style for 2020? If we were to put a slide in there for 20, the decade for 2020, what do you predict will be the fragrance style? I think it's less about, I think it's less about a fragrance style it's more about how fragrance reflects your individuality and I really think that um, having done this now in for um, 12 years on the custom fragrance business it's more about feeling confident feeling um, understanding your individuality and projecting a feeling of this is me I'm confident, I'm wearing a fragrance that makes me feel amazing. And I don't care if it's a floral or a citrus or a woodsy or spicy, whatever that category is, that is not sort of the popular category de jour. If you know, spice is de jour of, of the 1980s or the florals were, it doesn't matter if as long as a fragrance reflects who you are. And I really feel that today, it's all about being confident because, you know, at the end of the day, everybody wants to 
feel good about themselves, pamper themselves, particularly during this dreadful time that we've all been through. So if you can wear a fragrance that you say, oh, I love this, but it's not the popular time. It's not a floral and the florals are so important. And, you know, I happen to love rose, but some people think rose is so old fashioned, reminds you of my grandmother. But if you love rose and you think it really makes you feel wonderful, then wear rose. Now, there are some roses, with all due respect, that can be a little heavy and a little old fashioned but you have to find the rose that is a little bit more modern that reflects you and um, uh, that makes you feel good. It's, I think, honestly, it's all about feeling good. I don't think there are any rules right now. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because of what's happened online, social media, YouTube, Pinterest, all these you know, internet apps, we're able to be who we are. Look, we're all Zooming. Who thought that Zoom would be a way that we would all be interacting? Um, and even when you wear Zoom, you want to feel good, you want to look good, so, um, and you want to smell good. <laughs> well, I think that's a fantastic, very uh, good prediction, fantastic prediction, and also very inspiring. We are at the end of our program. Thank you oh. so much for joining us today. Sue, what a pleasure it is to talk to you. Um, I want to remind our audience that if you're interested in Sue's book, The Power of Perfume, how to choose it, wear it, and enjoy it, the link to pre-order this is in the chat box. If you're interested in any of the other programs presented by the National Arts Club, you can visit our YouTube channel. You can also go to nationalartsclub.org. I am Angela Louie. This is Sue Phillips. And thank you so much for joining us. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for your wonderful questions and for paying such wonderful attention. And I hope to hear from you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Have a good evening. Bye -bye. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Valentine's Day.